manager for high risk teams for about 11 years doing that. Um, I got really turned on to this particular information when I became a part of the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative Symposia here in Alberta where we kind of began to examine brain architecture and look at addiction and how it was connected to brain architecture in a different way. Um, from that, I really kind of amalgamated what that taught me with the teachings of gurus in the field like Dr. Bruce Perry, Dr. Claudia Black, Dr. Gabor Mate, who is certainly our North American Canadian expert on addiction and on child development and connectedness and all of that stuff that we'll be reviewing tonight. So the title of this webinar is Self-Regulation for the Stressed Brain and we're definitely going to discuss some strategies around that and what that can look like for a stressed brain. Um, but first and foremost, we don't know how to teach regulation until we understand how a stressed brain, brain pardon me, is formed and why that happens. So when we look at a stressed brain and we look at even the word stress, we tend to think of a heavy load or something that is too burdensome to carry. Um, stress er, is used also to describe overwhelming amount of things to do, maybe um, expectations that exceed anybody's capability or perceived capability, or it could be an avalanche of adverse conditions or events that create stress um, and when I say that what I mean specifically is <clears throat> trauma either massive traumas major traumas or a series of micro traumas and all of those things are kind of what we're going to dive into tonight but no matter what it is in order to understand what a stressed brain is we even have to go further back than that and we need to decide what is a healthy brain and what makes a healthy brain. And so there are many components that feed into what create healthy brain architecture. But the top three that I have chosen to discuss tonight, first and foremost, is stimulation. Um, when babies are born, then, well, there's two times, let me back up just a second. There are two times in our life when we experience extraordinary brain growth, when we have the capacity to learn to a greater density than we will ever see at any other time in our life. And one is from the age of zero to five. The second time is during the teenage years. Okay, so when we're looking at having a tiny little one from zero to five, and we're looking at what goes on with brain architecture when that particular little individual is being stimulated, what we see is that the pathways that are being stimulated are the pathways that grow and, and build themselves. Um, the pathways, however, that are not being stimulated are experience what we call pruning. And pruning occurs, and I'll give you a couple of examples, and they're very exaggerated examples, but um, I like to use them simply because they illustrate the point really, really well. Pruning occurs when you simply don't use the potential that is, that is currently there waiting for you. So, for example, if we have a little person, age zero to five, who is exposed to several different languages, or even two different languages, that little individual will have the capacity to learn both of those languages with extreme proficiency. And they will be absolutely fluent. Why does that happen? Because the brain has a ready-made pathway that is just raring to go for that kind of stimulation. And it says, oh, okay, you want to learn English and you also want to learn Romanian? Absolutely. I've got pathways available for, for that to be stimulated and for us to learn those things and to file it away so that you have it for the future. On the flip side, when those same pathways are not lit up and they are not stimulated, the number one thing, and you're going to hear me repeat this so many times tonight that you're going to get tired of it, is that the brain is an efficient machine. And so with its efficiency, it will see that 
for example, oh, you're only learning English? Not a problem. And for after the age of five, it will take a look at all of those pathways to all of those other languages and it will prune them away. Now, does that mean that that individual will never, ever be capable of picking up a second language? Of course not. Um, at any time, because the brain is elastic, there's elastoplasticity, there's oodles of time in, in the lifetime to learn different things. However, it will never, ever learn those languages to the degree of fluency that it could have learned them when that optimal time, when that potential was readily and ripely available. And it's because the brain, being efficient, has said, we don't need these, we can cut these roadways off, and we do not need to travel down those pathways. Instead, we're going to go directly to the English language, and we're going to to learn it with extraordinary proficiency, okay? Same concept, pruning, different example, and this is a more extreme example and a very sad example, actually. Um, if you have a little child, uh, again, zero to five, and you lock that child away in a room with no windows and you never turn a light on, that child, despite the fact that its ocular system will be working perfectly fine and there will be nothing amiss there, nonetheless, will develop, but will go blind. And that's, again, the idea of pruning, because the brain will say, I am not getting stimulated along this particular neural pathway. I must not need it. I am not going to pour energy into that direction. I am going to cut that pathway off, and I'm going to get rid of it altogether. Why is that important in terms of what we do in terms of building a healthy brain? Well, obviously, the more stimulation a child receives in terms of what we call serve and return interaction, meaning communication between caregiver or caregivers, plural, and that child, the more pathways will remain intact and the more potential will remain intact for that particular individual to learn skills over their lifetime. Okay, so they are never going to be necessarily in the position where they will have to develop a pathway later on in life. Um, they won't have to learn Romanian later on in life if we want to keep, keep on with that particular example, because they will have learned it from when they are very, very small and it would have been carried forward. The same type of um, concept, uh, pruning, goes along with the whole idea around self-regulation. When children do not learn the self-regulation skills when they are little or when they are in their teen years, in those optimal years of brain development, that doesn't mean they can't ever learn how to self-regulate. But what it does mean is that they're going to have to put more time, more effort, and more learning into those particular skills in order for them to stick because the brain being efficient has seen that those pathways and said yeah they're not getting stimulated I don't need those okay um, so that's the concept of pruning and how it relates to stimulation or lack thereof okay serve and return we talked about that just briefly and I touched on it and said this is the communication that occurs between caregiver or caregivers plural and a, a, a young person or a child and the optimally the more serve and return that's occurring the better, obviously. That means having conversations. That means singing songs, reading stories, and it also means eye contact with your youth, with your tiny person, okay? So looking into the eyes, being present, um, being accounted for, and not just physically present, but emotionally present in terms of engaging. Serve and return means essentially communicating slash engaging. The third thing that we find builds a healthy brain is tolerable stress. And yes, I said stress. Um, now, what do we mean when we say tolerable stress? Because there's a, a really marked difference between tolerable stress and toxic stress, which we'll get into. Tolerable stress, we're talking about things like failing a test. Um, we're talking about things like not, get it, not get, being the only kid, not getting invited to the birthday party. Um, we're talking about things like not making the team. 
Uh, we're talking about things like having to repeat a certain grade or a certain subject in school because they just didn't get the knack of it the first time. Um, this can be tricky for parents and I admit I am as a parent I'm one of these people that fi can find it tricky because our tendency as loving parents is to get in there and somehow rescue or fix it. Um, and sometimes, and I, I can take this bullet because I've done it, um, sometimes we can bubble wrap. Bubble wrapping is never a good plan because essentially, again, what happens is that whole concept of pruning comes into play. And if these kids never have to learn how to sort through those really difficult or hurtful emotions and sit in those feelings and sort through them and feel them and put them into some kind of perspective, if they're if they're bailed out of those particular incident, incidents, they're not going to retain the skills and abilities to deal with the big gut punches that come later in life. And so as a result of that, we see that depriving them of those moments of tolerable stress essentially ends up creating one of the many components that can create the whole concept of a stressed brain. Okay, um, so rescuing kids does the opposite of what you want it to do because it deprives the opportunity to build skills and capacity and it can also make a tremendously big impact on whether or not these kids build empathy. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of when we have the child or the youth who engages in an activity which has perhaps hurt somebody else and our tendency or maybe somebody wades in and wants to rescue them from the consequence of that, ac of that action. Not a good plan simply because you're depriving them of that moment of developing compassion and developing empathy or from refining their compassion and their empathy. Okay. Moving on, so with all that being said about what builds a healthy brain, what, is, what exactly is the stressed brain? So a stressed brain is a brain that is chronically exposed to toxic stress. It leaves it in a state of high alert, and it has what we can, what, sometimes it has what we can call a high ACEs score, a high adverse childhood experiences score. And so toxic stress, what are the big bads? Well, things like death, divorce, chronic illness, uh, perhaps an accident, a uh, house fire, those major life events that were extremely traumatic can create components that lead toward a stressed brain. However, those same big events can also fall under the category that we call tolerable stress if they are dealt with and addressed appropriately for that particular child or youth. However, when those big deals are not rolled through in a way that is understandable or helps the child process those, then they can lend into the, the architecture that we call a stressed brain. Okay. Um, now, other stressed brain sorts of um, micro traumas, if you will, we can lump poverty, abuse in all of its forms, neglect, parental addiction. Um, and the other thing to remember, when we talk about kids who have experienced these extraordinary circumstances, whether they're on a micro level or a macro level or a combination of both, we need to also understand that even within one particular family, this can very much vary. Um, so what I mean by that is that one child in, a fa in the same family can have a radically different experience in terms of the toxic stress that they're exposed to than another child in the same exact family. It can depend on a lot of things. It can depend on birth order. It can depend on financial station of parents where, with the first child versus the second child versus the fifth child. It can depend on whether or not perhaps there was um, domestic disharmony or divorce, something like that occurring in the midst of the kids being at different developmental stages and ages, remembering again that uh, those optimal times of zero to five versus the teenage years when that brain develop is, development is really exploding and has more potential than at any other time. So lots of different things, lots of different variables can actually change 
the level of toxic stress that children, even in the same family, experience. And we'll talk in a, in a few slides, we'll talk about how that can look extraordinarily different in terms of um, how siblings interact with each other and how they can sometimes rely on each other's skills or their, their, their skills in terms of dealing with the chronic stress and how that can play one off against the other and kind of set up a, a stage for a lifetime in terms of family roles kind of repeating themselves over and over again throughout their adult lifetime. Um, so what do I mean when we say we're in a state of high alert? It means that the brain that has a tremendous amount of stress going on, micro traumas, big traumas, or a combination thereof, is always on a state of high alert. And it is because, again, back to that concept of the brain being a really efficient machine. When the brain determines that it is needing to be protecting of the organism at all times, what will happen is it will remain in a state of fight, flight, or freeze for a great deal of the time, and it will, go, it will pour all of its energy that direction. Okay, and other areas of the brain will get less attention um, because the brain's number one goal from birth is survival. Okay, so that's the number one goal of any single human being on the planet. The number one goal of the brain is to figure out a way to survive. And so if it perceives that it is under threat more than it is not, then the energy is going to be poured in that direction of being on alert all of the time because it knows that it basically has to keep its head on a swivel and looking around to gauge the environment and the circumstance for any kind of danger. Okay? Um, a stressed brain will also have what we call a high ACEs score. Now, what are a high ACEs? Well, in 1997, the Kaiser Permanente came upon the concept of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale almost by accident. They discovered it in a really funky way. They were working with an obesity clinic, of all things, and what they were noticing was that there was a pattern of these persons that were taking part in this obesity clinic, and they'd do well, do well, do well, uh, and then they'd backslide, and they'd be back to square one, so to speak. And the folks that were um, um, administering this obesity clinic were quite confounded by what was going on here. And so they decided to look at it not harder, but differently. And they began to put some questions to the participants in this particular study for obesity. And one of the questions that they put to them ended up delivering quite a startling answer. And the question was this, have you ever in your lifetime been sexually abused? And what they discovered was that close to 100% of the participants in this particular study answered, why, yes, I have. And from that, there was some compassionate curiosity going on in terms of, is there some sort of link between what has happened emotionally to these people and what is occurring physically for these people? And what, did, what was Kaiser Permanente going to do to explore that link? Well, Dr. Robert Anda, who would many years later go on to be one of the chief consultants for the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative, of which I was a part and of which I first was introduced to this information, began to develop a battery of questions. And the questions that he put together captured those major life events of micro traumas and major traumas and wove them together in such a way that they were able to develop a 10 point scale that captured with some amazing accuracy, a predictive ability in terms of how we can look at somebody's lifetime and do some forecasting about what will occur for them even on a physical health basis if they have what we call a high ACEs score. Okay? So, 
What is what are high, whoops sorry what are high aces? Um, I'm going to read you and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, the ten point scale. You can along at home. You can keep track if you'd like to score your own, or you could score it for somebody that you know, or you could score it for several people at the same time, or you could score it for no one at all, and you can just take a listen to the ten points that were developed by Kaiser Permanente, Dr. Robert Anda, back in '97. And the first one is, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? Or did they act in a way that made you feel afraid that you might be physically hurt? If so, if for every one of these, by the way, you score one. Number two, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? Or ever hit you so hard that you left that it left marks or you were injured number three did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touched their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral vaginal or anal intercourse with you number four did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or that your family did not look out for each other and did not show allegiance or support to each other. Five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes and had no one to protect you? Or were your parents too drunk or high to take care of you to, or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Number seven, was your mother or stepmother or other guardian ever pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at them, or sometimes, often, or very often, kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit for at least a few minutes, or at least a few minutes, or threatened with a gun or a knife. Number eight, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker, alcoholic, or used street drugs? Nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member ever attempt suicide? And the last one, number 10, did a household member ever go to prison? Out of the 10 point adverse childhood experiences scale, what we see for our participants who take the, take the scale and then relay what is happening for them in their lives. We find that anybody with a score of four or more will experience significant changes or a ability to cope with self-regulating, as we're talking about tonight. They will uh, experience difficulty developing and maintaining relationships. They will absolutely experience difficulty and the, the development of different diseases that make a significant impact on their health and well-being. And we'll discuss those a, a little bit more in detail as we move forward. But first and foremost, the most important thing to remember, and back to that whole idea of the brain's energy going to where it believes it needs to be the most, because the brain is A, an efficient machine, and B, something that is geared to ensure our survival. An overactivated fear center equals a stressed brain. And it is because, like I just said, the brain's number one priority is survival. And in its efficiency, if it perceives it is under threat, and whether it is or it isn't, right? Um, if that brain, if that person perceives some sort of threat, it will react in one of three different ways. Okay, so when I, an analogy I like to give in, in terms of this is a, a couple different things. First and foremost, if we imagine the brain as being a guy who goes to the gym, okay, so here's our guy who goes to the gym, our brain, and it's always exposed to a lot of fear, a lot of stress, a lot of adverse um, experiences that make it feel like it needs to be on high alert all the time. It's the same as the dude that goes to the gym and all he ever does is works his upper body and his arms. So here he is, he's all buff, he's all built from, from the waist up, his torso is a torso of the gods, and yet he's got these little tiny stick legs because that part of him has never been developed. When we compare the fear center of the brain 
to the executive functioning part of the brain, which is where the logic is, which is where the pleasure is, which is where um, the ability to do critical thinking lives, all of those things. When we compare them, we find the same kind of thing for somebody who has a lot of adversity in their life, a lot of micro traumas, macro traumas, high ACEs score. We find that the fear center is the bulky guy and the executive functioning, he's the little skinny dude. Okay, so um, the other way to look at that, a different analogy, is if we imagine a neural pathway being like cement with your finger being dragged through it over and over and over again, every time we have this brain who is ex that is exposed to perceived threat, if every single time that that brain is exposed to perceived threat, it is like somebody dragging their finger through cement. And that crevice in the cement gets deeper and deeper and deeper, okay? So it becomes the QE2, whereas the pathway to the rational thinking, the logical thinking, the critical thinking, the relaxation, the self-pleasure, the self-regulation, that's like a goat path if you want to compare them. So we've got the QE2 that goes to the fear center as opposed to the little tiny goat path that you got to wend your way through the weeds to get to the executive functioning part. That's a good comparison for those two things, how one can be buffed up and the other one can, can really, really um, be underdeveloped. And as a result, that ability to self-regulate becomes really stunted doesn't mean that the brain doesn't crave it, doesn't mean that the brain does not absolutely need it, and yet the, the ability to access that part of the brain that could be proficient in that arena is really, really limited because this is a brain who has been exposed to a tremendous amount of fear all of the time. Okay, so when we're talking about fight, flight, or freeze, what are we looking at? Well, the person who fights is a person who perceives chronic danger, and they're going to be highly physically reactive or verbally reactive or both. And that is going to be how they have learned how to deal with this particular circumstance that they have been exposed to over and over and over again. The second thing they may do is they may flight. And when we talk flight, uh, we're saying that the person that is facing chronic danger will literally flee. So they will run away, or maybe they'll go hide, or maybe they'll get, you know, the old cliche, make themselves scarce. That may be their choice uh, in terms of what they do, okay? The third example is freeze. And a person who perceives chronic danger might experience what we call involuntary immobility. And this is, doesn't even necessarily, the freeze option that the brain will, and the brain is like a little Rolodex when it is in that fear center and it knows it needs to react, it is flipping through this Rolodex of three things very, very quickly and deciding what am I going to do and what is my best option here. Now, I want to talk about these just for a couple of moments because some of them are, there are nuanced and they're very, very important to, to explore in a tiny bit of detail. Um, first and foremost, when we're looking at, um, for example, sexual assault victims, many times I have heard over the years in my practice, sexual assault victims um, ridiculed or called into question because you just laid there you did not fight back. So was it really rape? Well, I'm here to tell you that the brain is an efficient machine. And when it is faced with that kind of danger, that level of danger, like I said, it is flipping through that little Rolodex of fight, flight, or freeze very, very quickly. And it is brilliant in terms of which one of those three options it is going to pull forward and say, I am doing this. And so when we have somebody who is a sexual assault victim, believe me when I tell you, their brain has thought, should I fight? But then the brain has gauged the size of the perpetrator and it's weighted against the size of itself. And it said, nope, I can't fight because I'm not going to win. And so then it goes to flight and it says, should I flee? Should I run away? Well, again, it is perceiving that the person, the perpetrator, is much bigger and larger and perhaps is even pinning them down. They, therefore, flight 
is also not an option for this particular person who is in this incredibly stressful situation. And so the last option on the Rolodex is freeze. And the brain says, freeze is the only option I have. And freeze harkens back to the caveman days when we were out there trying to hunt for our food and bust open a pterodactyl egg and a saber-toothed tiger came running along um, through the bush and we see it and all of a sudden we freeze and we get right up tight against the tree and we hope, 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 hope that as we're expending all of that energy to be as still as possible that the perpetrator will just pass us by and leave us alone, okay? Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier how this kind of mechanism, the fight, flight, freeze mechanism, the experience of a stressed brain can vary even within siblings and a family. So I'm going to give you guys an example um, of a family that I am aware of. This is a family of three boys. <clears throat> they are all very much grown men now. Um, this is a family where the adverse childhood experiences scale scores for all of them would have been extremely high. Uh, one member had been to jail. There was a tremendous amount of domestic violence. Uh, physical punishment, extreme physical punishment was used within the home. There was rarely enough to eat. Poverty was a tremendous issue in this particular household. Um, ridicule, humiliation, embarrassment, all of those things occurred on a regular basis. I think I mentioned domestic violence already. If I didn't, that was also playing a whole role. And so we have these three boys. We have an oldest boy, a middle boy, and a youngest boy. The oldest boy in this particular scenario learned very quickly that if he would fight his father, his father would back down. Okay, so whenever the scenario rolled out that he was, his fear center was lit up and his head was on that swivel and things were going down in the home, he would step in and he would fight. Okay, the second brother, however, would literally go and hide under the bed. He'd disappear. So his flight mechanism kicked in. And the littlest guy, well, the littlest guy mentored after oldest brother, and he would let oldest brother look after things while he simply stayed very, very still and hoped he would not be seen, okay? Let's fast forward this to adulthood. That's what occurred when they were back at home. Now they're all adults. And what has happened? Well, my first guy, my fighter, he has a tremendous habit of getting into fisticuffs with not just anybody, but with police officers. <laughs> and why does he get into fisticuffs with police officers? Because he perceives them as an authority. Who is an authority in his life? Well, his father was an authority in his life. And so on an unconscious level, he is often in combat with anybody who he perceives to be authority because he perceives them to be out to get him, okay? Second brother, second brother who used to flee sadly, developed quite a lifestyle of addiction because he was self-medicating, because that hit was his chosen method of self-regulation, if you will. But because that created a cascade of other issues for him and because he had a very difficult time coming to terms with the issues that had happened at home, he actually ended up completing suicide. And so that is a very dramatic and an incredibly tragic example of flight to the extreme. Last brother, well, last brother, let's hearken back to our just our previous example of what happens to somebody who's sexually assaulted sometimes, oftentimes they will freeze. This particular gentleman was actually receiving medical treatment from a medical pro professional who um, assaulted him. And in the throes of that assault, that particular gentleman reverted back because again, the, the, the brain that is stressed will react on emotion, not logic. Okay, it doesn't mean the person is not intelligent. It means that in that moment, their emotions are running the show. And as he flipped through his Rolodex of the things that used to work for him, whenever he was under threat, what he did was he froze. He froze during that incident and then experienced a tremendously long time of self-blame, self-doubt, and self-ridicule until he was able to come to terms with the fact that, wait a minute, this is just the way my brain learned how to deal with any threat and that it used it as a template. 
and he used it as a template over and over and over again because he never learned a different way to deal with it. Okay, so fight, flight, and freeze. Bonnie, can I stop you for a second? You, you do betcha. have a few comments in the chat. Okay. okay. They're both from Amanda. Um, the first one says, how can we help a child student who is stressed if their parents aren't there as a support or don't think there is anything wrong? Since mm -hmm. we only have them in our care for a certain amount of time, she would like some suggestions for that. So that's comment one. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to hop ahead then, and I'm going to answer that right now. But we're get, when we get into strategies, we'll talk about that I in particular. Um, oftentimes, yeah, you know, these kids who are coming from these backgrounds, they're often, more often than not, they're generational. And so it is not necessarily unusual to see these kids that are, that are coming out of these really turbulent backgrounds whose parents, uh, you know, truly aren't aware that this is really corrosive for this particular child or children. Um, they don't know it because this is their quote normal um, and maybe even better than what they experienced because one of the things we do when we're working with parents is we run through their ACEs score and then we say how can we make sure that your children's ACEs score is at least marginally lower than yours and certainly never at the same or higher than where yours is at. Well, what can we do to mitigate some of that stuff? But in terms of Amanda's question, what can they do at school? Because you're right, she, they have them for such a limited amount of time. And yet, these kids, more than other kids, need to see, <clears throat> pardon me, that there, is, there are safe adults whom, with whom they can connect and with whom they can feel like they are consistent people in their lives all of the time. And, and I don't mean consistent in terms of you're there every single day and you never have a sub come into your classroom. <laughs> what I mean by that is that you, are, you don't waver in terms of your reaction to them. Meaning if they do something where they deserve a consequence, you deliver that consequence and you deliver it cons with consistency every single time. Um, by the same token, when they do something well, you react to that the same way every single time. And I know that that sounds like such a small thing. And yet for these kids who have this incredible level of turbulence all of the time and this unpredictability going on in their lives all of the time where, like I said, their head needs to kind of be on a swivel constantly because they never know when the next um, spate of chaos is going to occur. That regular um, patterning, scheduling, this person who reacts in a consistent way every single time is far more comforting than you can possibly imagine. The, um, a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of teaching on the Sick Sick a Nation. I also teach violent threat risk assessment. And I was down there on the Sick Sick a Nation, Nation teaching VTRUP. And one of the elders who was part of the crowd shared in the most gentle, compassionate way with her female teachers, or pardon me, with her white teachers that were there. And she said, you know what, you guys, when you make excuses for our kids because of, and this was a quote directly from her, because of your own white guilt and shame, and you let them off the hook for things that they need consequences for, you're not doing them a favor. You're not doing them a favor because you're just lending into the chaos that they're already experiencing all of the time. And so they need that consistent reaction and interaction with the adults who care for them because that is exactly how they're going to interpret it is this is care for me that this is the same every time, that this doesn't change. Because remember, even if we're talking, and I'm using an example here, if we're talking about a kid who comes from an, an alcoholic home. What gets them belted across the room one day could give them a, get them a hug and a kiss the next day. Same exact behavior radically different reaction um, and that's one example of many uh, in terms of the turbulence and the inconsistency that these kids experience on a regular basis so if school can be somewhere a safe haven even if it is only for those six hours of the day that is the same and consistent every single time that all by itself can be tremendously soothing now along with the other um, um, 
strategies that we'll talk about in a little bit, but that is the first thing that comes to mind when Amanda poses that question is exactly that. Next comment. The next one, um, while we are helping these kids who have a stressed brain throughout the day, how can we, how can we help the other kids in the class who will see or hear these outbursts who may not be dealing with anything stressful, but now hearing or seeing another child go through it? Some suggestions would be helpful. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, uh, you know, it is important that when there are um, inappropriate outbursts, that these, these inappropriate behaviors absolutely need to be consequenced. Otherwise, and I hope I'm reading that comment, right? That, that otherwise the kids are going to say, hey, wait a second, how come there's one set of rules for, for Jack and a whole other set for Jill here? Like, what is going on? Is that kind of what, what the gist of that is? I think, I think. Um, so again, back to that whole concept of consistency, um, acknowledging, and that whole idea of compassion being modeled both ways, because it's not just the kids who are not experiencing the adversity at home, who are not having that whole concept of a stressed brain going on for them at home, who need to possibly execute compassion for those who are. It is also the kids who do have the adversity going on for them, that sometimes are so locked into that reaction mode that their ability of, the, of, of um, executing compassion and empathy that also lives in that whole executive functioning area of their, of their brain. Um, is far less developed. And so to give that, you know, kind of gentle feedback in terms of saying, you, you know, this is, this is how other people experience you. Um, and the, to the other kids, and this is, you know, like it, it's creating that fine balance between interacting with them, but still holding accountability where accountability needs to be held because virtually all of the kids need to see that, that the rules are the same regardless, regardless. And I think that that can be executed quite compassionately. I hope that I'm answering that. Uh, I hope I'm understanding that comment or question. I hope so. Um, at, Amanda added, um, yes, but also those other kids might be now scared yes. to come to school because they see these other kids having outbursts. Right. Right. And, you know, and, and again, you know, this is this is wading a little bit into wa uh, the water that I that I teach from when I do violent threat risk assessment. And in terms of the kids who are exhibiting these really worrisome behaviors and that and it, or even threatening behaviors. And it is um, crucial to address the safety needs and to be aware of the safety needs of other kids because the, the sad reality of this entire circumstance is that yes these kids are coming from a home where there's a tremendous amount of adversity but by virtue of their acting out behavior they may in fact be raising an ACEs score for other kids in the classroom who aren't experiencing adversity in, at home, but they're experiencing it at school. And so, you know, I, I, Amanda's point is not lost on me, is that how do you strike a balance between those children so that nobody's needs are falling through the cracks, especially if we've got kids who are literally afraid to come to school because we've got one kid who's got outburst after outburst after outburst, and possibly even it sounds like um, some threats of violence or at least implications of violence going on that are making the other kids unsafe. And for that, I say again, um, there needs absolutely to be consequences and um, some kind of a safety plan for that child and that should not be left up to the teacher alone in my opinion um, that needs to be more of an approach where maybe you're pulling admin in maybe if you do have a violent threat risk assessment team you can pull them in your FSL your family school liaison worker uh, counselor and say you know what are we going to do in terms of addressing the fact that we see that this particular child appears to be on a pathway to violence simply because we've got kids who are now afraid of him or her and and that is a very significant and serious issue that needs to be addressed. Can we can we go to the slide? Are we good? Or okay? Um, 
A stressed brain is sending uh, corrosive signals to the body. The heart rate increases, the blood pressure rises, breathing is rapid. Metabolically, these are folks who shut down, whose meta metabolism literally shuts down. Why? Because when they are locked in that fight, flight, freeze, the cortisol is flowing. And when cortisol is flowing, it jacks the heart rate and it'll send the blood pressure through the ceiling because this is the fuel that we need in order to fight, flight, or freeze. It will increase your breathing. It will constrict your blood vessels so that less blood flow is occurring in the body. It will absolutely shut down the metabolism because it's not going to burn any calories if it thinks that it needs to retain those calories in order to run or in order to, to, to hide or in order to freeze and to expend that energy and being very, very still. What we see over a course of a lifetime because cortisol has a very long shelf life. Here's an example. If you're in a uh, near miss car accident first thing in the morning, so it is seven o'clock in the morning and you're on the hand day and somebody cuts you off, you're in a near miss car accident and your heart rate jacks, your breathing gets shallow, you begin to shake. Um, this is cortisol flowing through your body. Now again, back to the idea, brain's an efficient machine, and it's saying, holy, we were under threat just now. I better make sure that I keep cortisol flowing in my system for the next 12 hours. Because I don't know if this guy's going to come back and cut me off again or run into my car or what have you. So anytime cortisol is kicked out in the fight, flight, freeze, it has a long shelf life and it stays in the system for a long, long time. What does that mean over the long haul for these people who are experiencing these micro traumas all of the time? Well, it essentially means that there is constantly cortisol flowing in their body. And so we find that over the course of a lifetime, these are the people who develop illnesses much, much earlier in life than we would expect them to. Um, these are the people who struggle tremendously with obesity, back to that whole first initial Kaiser Permanente ex exploration with adverse childhood experiences. It was born out of an obesity clinic, well, ta-da, it's not hard to understand why these folks struggle with obesity when all this cortisol is rolling through their body all the time and their metabolism shuts down. Their blood sugar stays high so that they could fight, flight, freeze. And they have literally created the perfect storm for, um, for their body to not burn fat. These are the people who maybe you know them that as adults, they have tried every diet coming down the pipes. They go to the gym for like six hours out of the day. They're running 10 miles every second day and let yet their body stays the same all of the time and weight loss becomes an extraordinary, extraordinary struggle for them. Part of the reason for these folks who are coming from this tremendous amount of stress is that the cortisol is just having a stranglehold on their system. And it's creating all sorts of upheaval in terms of how their body can function to its optimum because it believes it needs to be in the ready position all of the time when really, um, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. So when ACEs are high and toxic stress is chronic, we have, think, we can think of the brain as a canvas and anxiety as the paint. Now, let's turn up the volume on this just a little bit and let's toss into the mix um, the fact that we have kids, whether they're from a high ACEs background or not, that are using, um, pardon me, that are using tech all of the time. And so what are, they, what are they exposed to or what are they doing when they're using tech all the time? Well, the other thing that's being pruned away when, when they're doing that is patience. And here's why. When you are on your Snapchat all the time, when you're on your Facebook, when you're on whatever the case may be, especially the really high voltage social utilities that most kids use like Instagram and Snapchat, they're very, very, very rapid. And so the brain gets trained to have instant gratification from these things all of the time. And back, that, back to that idea of pruning, what occurs for these particular youth is that their brain says, oh, you mean I don't have to wait to get what I need? Awesome. I'm going to prune away those capabilities of patience and waiting. And I, am, I don't need them. 
because whatever I am looking for, I get it immediately. And so sometimes that can tra that too can translate into a tremendous amount of difficulty with these kids because they literally do not. They can come across very entitled because they literally don't seem like they have that capability of being able to wait it out and have some patience. Okay. Are there questions, Christine, or comments right now? Nope, not at the moment. Okay. Okay. So when we have this enlarged fear center and this shrunken executive function, we can literally see this on an MRI. When we look at these folks with an MRI and we can see that their amygdala is very, very big. Their fear center is very, very big. Their executive function, the place where all of that self-regulation should live, is very, very small. And, the, and again, it's back to that idea of energy flowing to the place of priority. So the fear center becoming the muscle man and executive functioning becoming the weakling. And I don't think, I don't know if you guys can, uh, my little slide is covered over here, but this old fashioned cartoon of the, the little skinny guy being on the beach and the big muscle man coming and kicking sand in his face. And then he needs to go and bulk himself up in order to do combat, if you will. And essentially that's what we're looking at doing when we are trying to teach self-regulation to these youth and to these little people is that we're trying to bulk up that area of executive function so that it can not do battle with their fight flight freeze mechanism but at least go toe to toe with it in such a way that instead of that emotional mind reacting all of the time and the intellectual or the logic mind kind of being in the background going, yeah, man, I got nothing because I'm really weak. We want to at least be able to bring them together. And this is kind of what we'd like it to look like. And I hope you guys can see this. This is a Venn diagram. No, oh, no, you guys can't see it at all. I don't think um, I'm holding up this Venn diagram. One of the circles is emotional mind. The other circle is intellectual mind, and where they cross over, what is written there is wise mind. And so our goal is always to try to beef those areas up in order so that they can experience some of the wisdom and the logic and the capability and the relaxation that would come normally to other kids without that adversity or without all of that stress that's going on for them. But it takes time and it takes effort and it takes certain skills and strategies to do that. And in the interim, we have these special considerations that also ring our bell as social workers, as educators, as whomever are dealing with these kids, because here's the other sad reality of the stressed brain. And one of those things is we're going to be left with a lap full of attention deficit with or without hyperactivity disorder. Now, why does this happen? Well, it's because, again, that executive function part of the brain has never, ever had the, it, it's, it's got the goat paths instead of the QE. Too. So the goat paths are going there, and as a result, that little air traffic controller who lives in all of our heads, who is able to make us sit still when we need to sit still, who helps us prioritize things, who helps us get our proverbial ducks in a row, and helps us slow down and think things through, that little guy in our head is sleeping because he's always been incredibly understimulated. So he's got no get up and go, which is why when kids are prescribed Adderall or Ritalin, it can seem counterintuitive to be giving a stimulant to a kid who has hyperactivity disorder. And you're like, well, what are you doing here? And the, hyper, the, the stimulant isn't being delivered to the part of the brain that is scattered. What the, where the stimulant is being delivered to the brain is to that sleeping air traffic controller who has never be, had the amount of stimulation he needs in order to stay awake and do his job. And But again, the additional complication, you guys will know this being educators, is that sometimes dosing can be a real nightmare in terms of what that looks like for kids because they're little flyweights. And so the doc who's working with whomever, whomever the guardian is and the child can sometimes feel like it's a little bit of a crapshoot in terms of the dosage for the Ritalin or the Adderall. 
for the youth in order to hit just the right note so that the kid does not quote feel like a zombie um, because a lot of kids I at least a lot of kids I've worked with who have been medicated and some adults too although adults seem to be more appreciative of their um, stimulant medication for their attention deficit than kids do but some will um, relay that concern that they that it makes them feel like kind of a zombie because it blunts the edges off of all of that high voltage stuff that's going on for them because the other reality and you guys as educators are going to be absolutely seeing this with these kids is that because the adrenaline is rocking and rolling so much of the time because that fear center is on high alert all of the time in terms of stress these are the kids who paradoxically can get addicted to their own adrenaline too and so you will watch them operate and you will see that they create chaos and you'll be going what is going on here this kid is coming from a home that's incredibly turbulent they've got some rock solid um, stability and consistency at this here at the school and yet here they are stirring the pot all the time what in the heck is that about well the brain will go where it feels most comfortable and the sad reality for these kids is that they feel most in control when they're totally out of control and that fear center is having to be on guard and on, on, in, in on high alert all the time. And so sometimes in that whole schema, um, they can create the chaos themselves and that whole concept of becoming, um, Gabor Mate calls it becoming addicted to their own adrenaline. Um, and they will, they will uh, stir the pot, stir the pot, stir the pot to kind of create the chaos. And so, um, you know, having said that, that doesn't make it easier to deal with them, but it can maybe um, help flesh out and hammer down some of the reasons why they do that. Um, the other thing that we need to consider with these particular individuals who are coming from this high stress, high ACEs background is that they have severe self-soothing impairments. Um, obviously, that's what we're talking about tonight. So there is an impulse there, the link between their impulse control and online gaming or addiction is extremely high. Um, the, and and there, that, there's a few reasons for that. Regardless of the fact that our brain's number one priority is survival, the other thing that is running in the background all of the time is that our brain is always looking away to feel pleasure. We are hardwired to feel pleasure. And when we do not or have not had the ability to learn that on our own, those self-soothing, those pleasurable things on our own, we will look externally in order to have that need met for us. And what does that externally very, very well? Alcohol and drugs work very good for that because, again, there's no waiting. And for these kids where patience has been an issue because they've always had to react in the moment very, very quickly, um, that can be, that can set a bit of a stage in terms of what we're looking at for addiction. And of course, the other thing, back to that whole idea of tech. And these are kids and all kids, unfortunately, are exposed to a tremendous amount of tech all of the time. And there's a real strong instant gratification piece to that, um, that you know, again, sets that whole stage for that pattern, that neural pathway to, to be right geared up, to want that instant gratification all of the time. An additional component to that is when we have a brain that has been stimulated in the fear center for more often of the time than it has not, and again, the brain being the efficient machine has said, oh, I'm supposed to be really, really alert all the time. Well, that must mean I need to be very, very sensitive all the time. And what it will do, it, it will literally build more sensitivity neurons than a brain that has not faced the same level of adversity that these particular people have. And as a result of that, I mean sensitivity literally, as in all of five senses will be more finely honed than they would be otherwise. And what that means is that food tastes better and drinks taste better too. And so alongside the, the need to self-soothe with an agent that does that very efficiently, being alcohol, for example, or food, if there's a food addiction or an obesity problem, the additional complicating factor is for these particular folks, it's also gonna taste better than it normally would. 
okay? Um, because they have all of that extra sensitivity going on. And it can also explain, you know, part and parcel, not only are these kids, <clears throat> pardon me, extremely reactive all the time, but they're also really, really, really sensitive to all of the information and the, the uh, stimuli that are going on all of the time. So they get rattled a little more easily or they get hurt feelings a little more easily. And these are the kids who um, you can think, oh my gosh, you know, how come Tommy is such a little tit all the time? Well, they literally do feel it a little deeper um, than other kids do. Not saying that to excuse build. I'm saying that to build context in terms of this literally happens in their brain architecture. So then with all of that being said, what soothes the stressed brain? The first thing I look at in terms of neurologically where we go to soothe some of this um, overly heightened fear center is to a place where we can experience for the or these kids or these people can experience repetition and rhythm. The brain is soothed by patterns and predictability. Um, so giving tasks and some of this is going to sound exactly you guys are going to have done this intuitively as educators my husband's an educator he's he's been a principal for several years now um, so intuitively you guys will have have done this with these particular kids tasks like repetitive um, stapling paper stapling a stack of papers uh, accompanying the TA down to the laminating room to do the laminating and then to do the cutting organizing colored sheets um, for our adults uh, some of our adults we gear them and we say you know what you want to soothe you want to slow yourself down when you're having a panic attack I want you to grab a big basket of laundry and I want you to fold that thing up and they're gonna look at you like you've got ten heads and you go, are you gonna be kidding me and it's like yeah you know what don't knock it till you tried it tried it come back and talk to me about it and they will say oh my gosh you know every time I fold it and put it down fold it and put it down it's patterning it's repetition it is mimicking of a soothing heartbeat to engage in some kind of repetitive behavior that has a rhythm to it okay and the added bonus is when they are finished those particular tasks, they will also see a finished product. And the finished product, no matter how small, will set off or light up, pardon me, the reward pathway in their brain because it will be a successful completion of something. And so not only will they have been engaging in the repetition and the rhythm, but they will also have a finished product at the end that gives them a, a tiny little burst of satisfaction. And we, the, why is this important? Because literally we need to rebuild those neural pathways that are goat paths that have never ever been fully developed. So for the kids who uh, don't come from this kind of a background or adversity, again, the, the, this kind of activity may or may not be helpful for them, but for the kids who need that settling, this repetition and rhythm can sometimes be extremely soothing for them to engage in. And now I'm gonna, with the next bullet, I'm gonna contradict myself completely, and I'm gonna say games like search a word, or if we have to introduce um, some kind of screen time, then a game like Candy Crush or Bejeweled, again, a game where you're looking for patterns, where you're, you're able to have tiny little bursts of success going on, those can be incredibly soothing. And the other piece that it does is while people are looking for these patterns and they're, they're squaring up all the things they've stapled or they're piling up all the things they've cut out and laminated or they're looping those words in the search word or candy crushed, bejeweled, what have you, while they are engaged in doing that, they have to be all in meaning their focus has to be on that particular task. And so when they're doing that, it becomes a very, very much a mindfulness activity for them too, in that they literally have to slow down and turn down the white noise that may be going on in their brain because of that overdeveloped amygdala. And they are reaching into that underdeveloped ex executive function and concentrating very hard. These folks, by the way, too, will take a longer time sometimes to do these very rudimentary, repetitive sorts of activities, um, simply because they are not used to doing that. And we want them to get used to doing stuff like that. So are there questions and comments from that right now? 
Uh, you did have a comment from Amanda. It says, okay. thank you, Bonnie. All of this information is very informative and the suggestions you mentioned are great. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, just another note on repetition and rhythm. Um, this is more geared toward adults who are struggling with these sorts of issues because, of course, you know, adversity doesn't just, you know, we don't turn off the button to our past just because we become adults. Um, there's a reason why adult coloring books are an incredible market and, and have been for the last few years. Um, in my side life, I am a fiction writer, and the last writer's conference I was at, agents were crying for people to submit to them adult coloring books because they are such a hot seller. And again, this whole idea of being very, very mindful in an activity and picking colors and choosing colors and all of these things. And I know it sounds like the simplest thing in the world and it sounds like, a, you know, no pun intended and no brainer. And yet it is incredibly soothing to engage in that particular activity. Under the umbrella of repetition and rhythm again, we got to uh, also slot exercise and physical activity. The reason why, there's a couple. First and foremost, when we engage in some kind of exercise, typically, if it's cardiovascular in particular, there is, again, a rhythm to that. If you're running, there's a rhythm of footfalls on the pavement. Um, or if you're running down the basketball court, there's that rhythm that, that comes along with that. Uh, weightlifting is another excellent one because there's lots of repetition there. Obviously, they call them reps, as a matter of fact. Now, for little tiny kids, that's not an option, but exercise certainly is. And the other thing that exercise does is that it releases endorphins in the brain. And essentially, when somebody says, oh, you've got the runner's high, um, that is not actually a cliche. That is a literal thing. When these particular individuals, and especially because they have a heightened sensitivity, remember? So when they engage in some kind of really strenuous physical activity, it's going to light their reward pathway up even more so than it lights the reward pa pathway up for somebody else. And and what that does is that retrains that whole executive function to say, hey, wait a second, this is a good place to put my energy. This feels really good. This makes me feel better than I feel when I'm not doing this. And so it makes that shift between being in that alert state to being in a place where they can learn how to do something that is self-soothing. Now, clearly this is all happening on an unconscious level, but why does physical activity help for these particular kids who are acting out all over in the, in the classroom and can't seem to settle themselves down? That's why. It's the endorphin connection. It is the repetition and rhythm connection of it too. Okay. Um, scheduling and few surprises. We talked about this a tiny bit earlier when Amanda posed her question about, you know, what do I do for this particular kid? Um, being that consistent person, remember, for the brain that is on high alert, uh, nothing reinforces its sense of instability like unanticipated activity. Um, on the flip side, predictability builds that neural pathway and allows that person to realize that there are places on this planet where serenity and safety exist. There are places in this world where the same thing happens every single time. There are places in this world where I'm a little turkey and I get disciplined the same exact way every single time. And lo and behold, the discipline my teacher gives me actually makes sense to me too. Huh, go figure. Um, what's that about? And yeah, over time, because again, we're talking about something, we're talking about a pathway that looks like a, like a weed infested footpath as opposed to a highway over time. When this happens over and over again, all of a sudden, we're slapping pavement down on that pathway. All of a sudden, the shift is happening and behavior might not change at home because home's no different. But school with the consistency stays the same. And you guys as educators, you have seen these kids who don't want to leave school. 
And sometimes this is one of the many components as to why. Because school is a place of a lot of serenity. There's a reason why, again, hearkening back to my work with violent threat risk assessment, there's a reason why we say the month before school holidays for any school that's been traumatized, the month before school holidays, you're going to see a lot of turbulence. And as teachers, I'm sure that you can concur with that because there's a lot of upheaval going on in those weeks. Um, if you're in at a, at a pardon me, at an elementary school, chances are your schedule is disrupted all over the map because you've got to practice for Christmas concert, all of that good stuff. And then for these particular kids for whom school is their safe haven of consistency and predictability, they're aware that in a couple weeks they've got to go home. And they've got to be home for 14 long days of a whole lot of inconsistency and a whole lot of turbulence. So, um, again, this is preaching to the choir. I totally know that because I have educators here in the room. But, uh, again, warning these kids in advance about things like fire drills, assemblies, other deviations. It doesn't change the fact that they're probably not going to make those transitions well. Um, because, again, anything that's turbulent to them, their brain is automatically going to interpret it as some kind of upheaval um, and, and, and as some kind of at least a low-grade threat. But at least warning them in advance. Again, slowly over time, they're going to develop a sense of comfort when that hand lands on their shoulder and says, you know what, there's going to be a fire drill today and it's going to be around this time um, or what have you, right, because that they can trust in that. Because bearing in mind, these are the kids coming from all of this adversity. One of the things that they have not been able to develop to any capacity because it simply hasn't presented itself to, itself to them is a sense of being able to trust. And school is often a place where they can develop a tremendous amount of trust. Okay. Now, eliciting positive memories. Now, what's that about? Okay. Making journals, online photo albums, real photo albums, drawing or making posters of favorite memories is powerfully soothing, and here is why. When we do this, so when we have cortisol in our system, cortisol is our stress hormone, cortisol is the one I touched on that creates all those long-term health um, difficulties. Uh, cortisol keeps our fear on the ceiling and keeps our head on that swivel. Well, DHEA, DHEA pardon me, is another hormone, but it's cortisol's polar opposite. And here's why it is so incredibly powerful and important. DHEA is a hormone that is released when we are feeling extremely happy. And the cool thing about it is our head, our brain will bank it. So when we experience the first time we hike Moline Canyon, maybe, and we're amazed and awed by the beauty there, okay, our head will bank that experience. So when somebody says to me, I'm having my panic attack or I'm fresh out of a panic attack and somebody says, okay, Bonnie, you know what, we're going to do a mindfulness activity right now and I want you to do a guided imagery and I want you to walk me through that time you were at Moline Canyon. And I want you to employ all five of your senses. I want, to, I want you to tell me what did it look like, what did it smell like, what did it feel like when you reached out and maybe touched some of the ice there, all of your five senses. And as I immerse myself into that memory and relaying that memory, whether I'm doing it verbally, whether I'm drawing, or whether you've given your student a journal exercise that they have to do this, here's what's going on in their brain. The DHEA is being re-released from its bank. And as the DHEA is flowing in their brain, they are elevated in terms of their mood and their sense of well-being. The other thing that is incredibly important that's going on is that the human brain cannot release DHEA and cortisol at the same time. It's either one or the other. So when the DHEA is flowing, even out of the bank, the faucet for the cortisol has no, has no choice but to be cranked off. And so the cortisol stops flowing. That doesn't change that it will still have its shelf life, but that means no more will be ro rolling in the system at that particular period of time. And more importantly, the DHEA will be flowing and it will be present. So it's going to elevate that student's state of mind and their sense of well-being. Um, so these are a few tiny little strategies to maybe get them to engage in or to have in your back pocket or your TA's back pocket for those times for those really high-risk kids when maybe you can reframe 
some of the mood that is happening for them or you see them come in that day and you can just tell that little storm clouds hanging over their head and today is going to be one of those days well this may be something for them to engage in in some way shape or form and i would suspect there would be ways to make it fold into curricula somehow in terms of language arts or what have you um, but these are these are different strategies to pull forth that dhea by eliciting positive memories okay um, woo woo words like gratitude interest and hope um, now uh, gratitude way back in the day when I was a brand new social worker I, I firmly believed I was 23 years old and very idealistic but nonetheless I, I very much believed that there was a mind body spirit connection and I always used to say what you do to one will affect the other two and sometimes I would be called a flake or worse but then when this aces stuff came to the surface and it kind of buttressed some of what I had believed for my entire career. It felt really good. So hearing these woo-woo words and understanding why things like gratitude, interest, and hope truly do make a neurological difference was really very cool for me. But then again, I'm a bit of a geek. So here we go. The neurological merit of tapping into gratitude. So again, sitting down with that student or having some kind of activity for them to reflect on what are you grateful for? It does not have to be a big thing, okay? If you were to ask, you know, me on my crummiest day, what are you grateful for? I might say, gee, you know, maybe the coffee tasted good this morning. But here is what happens. When we feel gratitude, it does a couple things to our system. First and foremost, it releases oxytocin in our brain. Oxytocin is our love hormone, okay? So... What that essentially does is reminds us in that moment of gratitude, it reminds us why, we're, why we love our life or why we love components of our life. The other thing that it does in the human brain is that it boosts the neurotransmitter serotonin. And that is identical to what the drug Prozac does the antidepressant drug Prozac does, and other SR, SSRIs also boost the neurotransmitter uh, serotonin. So reflecting on gratitude will literally change the brain chemistry for the individual who is engaged in that particular activity. Okay, um, so extremely powerful stuff going on there. And like I said, it can be as simple as starting out with the smallest, tiniest thing because you're going to find, and you guys know this far better than me because you work with these kids, these are the kids who can be extraordinarily pessimistic. So, you know, you can do, do some gentle inquiry or compassionate inquiry on around what you're grateful for, and you may get nothing. Um, but if you probe and prod even for the smallest, smallest, thing that they can feel gratitude for. Draw me a picture of that. What did that sound like? What did that look like? What it also does as it's releasing the serotonin, as it re is releasing the oxytocin, is that it is also lighting up that reward pathway. And when we light up our reward pathway by reflecting on gratitude, we essentially will crave more. It's kind of like an addict craving more. And so they will say, oh, and, and then there's this that I feel grateful for too. And this, and this, and this. And so that engagement in that activity of feeling gratitude is incredi can be cr incredibly powerful for these folks who are really, really struggling with how to self-regulate on their own and building that in as a habit. And maybe fostering some kind of idea like you have your job is to do a gratitude journal or what have you um, for these particular youth. Uh, interest. Showing interest allows us to feel um, like we have potential. And these are kids who either consciously or unconsciously can feel very much like they don't necessarily have potential. And so probing and again doing that compassionate inquiry in terms of what are you interested in? What really, what really makes you think about things or makes you want to know more or what subject would you like to research? Or what, it doesn't matter what it is. It does not matter what it is. It could be skateboard wheels. It doesn't matter. If they are feeling interested in something, internally they are building hope and they are reminding themselves that they have potential. Hope also teaches the stressed brain that there is more than just the moment. The brain that is stressed is very much what we call a prisoner of the present. 
okay? So it is locked in that sense of fight, flight, or freeze, and it's feeling like I've got to react in the moment. When you can re-engage somebody into thinking about something like hope, hope is a future concept. And getting them to think about a future concept literally pulls them out of that trap that of the, the present and gets them thinking about something in the distance. And again, it reawakens that whole concept of there is potential here. There is potential here. Again, either consciously or unconsciously. And of course, dependent on the age of the child that you're executing this kind of a strategy with, you know, something it's going to be very simplified for an elementary student. It could be extremely complex for somebody who's in high school or junior or middle school. Um, they can they can tackle these kinds of concepts with a lot more acuity when they're a little bit older, but they're going to have the same exact effect on them. Um, and PS, all of these states also release more DHEA, um, meaning that they are queuing into times that feel good. And they're pulling that hormone forward. And when we're pulling that hormone forward, we have no choice in the brain but to turn the cortisol off. Okay, creativity in the brain's reward circuitry, an understimulated under pleasure center needs to learn how to be lit. Creating art, writing, music, photography, any or all of these will light up the brain's reward center. Why? Because these are, it, these are times when the individual is creating something that, regardless of how it looks to somebody else or sounds to somebody else, if it's music, it feels good and looks good and sounds good to them. And that whole idea of allowing them to execute or create something beautiful for their eye, again, goes back to that whole idea of the brain's reward pathway, learning how to be lit by something that is very life-giving in terms of an activity. And so creativity of any stripe is extraordinarily powerful in teaching these particular students and youth self-regulation. There is a reason why there are so many musicians when you research them, and I'm talking famous musicians, who will report having had an extraordinarily turbulent childhood. And part of their musical acuity has come from the fact that they have learned somewhere along the way that this is an incredibly excellent self-soothing slash self-regulating sort of um, engagement of behavior that they can they can really enjoy this and that this can reroute things and pull things out of that whole um, emotional place and put it into the logical the pleasure feeling place okay the most soothing strategy for the stressed brain um, embedded in each of the aforementioned strategy is the implicit indication that the person in question is not engaging in them all alone that they are being cued or guided to do these things or that these things are being suggested to them without question connection and a loving relationship and amanda back to your comment earlier about you know what can i do for these particular kids when i have them for such a short amount of time you will be shocked at how much an, of an impact you are making in that short amount of time and you know what i'm not saying that to put sunshine where sunshine has no business being i am saying that not only from um from a place of, of loving and understanding this particular information but also from a place where i have lived with an educator for 25 years and I have seen the kids who he taught 20 years ago contact him on Facebook and tell him you know thank you Mr. Randall or what have you to Mr. Randall and he doesn't know who they are like he's taught a lot of them but they only had one of him and he has made an extraordinarily extraordinary pardon me difference in their life and it's because like every teacher you guys as well he loves kids <laughs> and he wanted to be with these kids and he wanted to help make a difference for these kids. And by virtue of you being here and taking part in the seminar, that's clearly the case for you too. So even though it sounds maybe corny or maybe trite, I do not mean it that way. I sincerely mean relationships are what make the difference. Um, and, and with that, I, I see that we're at 7.57, Christine. So I was, I was speed wrapping through a lot of that stuff. <laughs> But if we have any, any questions or comments, uh, I guess we have a couple of minutes to field any of those. Yes, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat or unmute your microphone and you can say them to Bonnie. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, Ruth is saying, thank you very much, Bonnie. This has been a highly informative session. Super. I'm glad that you enjoyed it, Ruth. Thank you for being taking part. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, I've always been in childcare my whole career, and then uh -huh. the last three months or so I've been with the school board. So um, I've been learning lots, and it's been a challenge, but it's also been really rewarding. So this, this seminar has helped a lot, so I will remember all the things that you've talked about tonight for when we have some, you know, near the end of the school year and things are changing and stuff like that. So I will remember a lot of this and this was really a really good uh, seminar. So awesome. Thank awesome. Thank you. I'm glad that you got a lot out of it. Uh, Dee is also saying, I'm not sure your, your full first name, but as she says, or he says, yes, I agree. Thank you so much. Lots of great pointers. I teach grade one with a few very stressed out with a few very stressed out kiddos. So this gave me a few tips to try out this week. Nice. Uh, life is a lot more turbulent for some of these little people than we would ever want it to be. That is sure true. Well, I'll just say before everybody leaves, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so I will upload it and um, send you all a link so you can view it later if you like. And we did send you the link to the slide so you can always come back to the information that Bonnie shared with us later on. So thank you so much, Bonnie. Thank you so much and looking forward to tomorrow to do a full day. <laughs> Sounds good, everyone. Have a great night. Night.